Well, what's happening in the course of the 17th and 18th century in Naples is that Naples is essentially subjected to tremendous growth, what we refer to as hypertrophic growth. Um, in around 1650, Naples hosts, it accommodates roughly 150,000 bodies. Um, and by 1800, it um, accommodates uh, well over 400,000 bodies. So its size almost triples over the course of 150 years. Uh, it increases by 300 percent. It's quite dramatic. Um, the growth is really quite dramatic. And on a yearly basis, there are just streams, constant streams of immigrants that are uh, coming, making Naples their destination. Um, so the city is really being transformed. It's being transformed in terms of um, its demographics. Uh, and it's, it's, also, it's also being enlarged uh, physically. Uh, it's also growing. It's developing suburbs uh, and gateway communities uh, that can house and accommodate those immigrants. There were no nations. And that's something for, that's hard for us to wrap our heads around. Um, so there were kingdoms. Uh, which were largely the remnants or the outcomes of feudal, uh, feudal arrangements. Um, so there's a kingdom of Naples, or the kingdom of Naples itself also plays host to a number of important cities, Naples being the single most important, and also a capital, and also a test case for the way early modern cities um, accommodate immigrants and uh, build, begin to build modern structures that can police them, and um, also govern them. That's because in 1650, Naples had suffered a plague, and it needs those bodies, it needs the workers, um, it needs new people uh, to help um, man its industries, uh, produce its food, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the city really makes um, an effort to uh, accommodate those immigrants, and it becomes increasingly porous. Prior to that, in 1600, when Naples was one of the largest capitals in Europe, in fact, it was the largest metropolitan area in Europe at the time, it still had walls that had true meaning. They had gates, they were shut at night, uh, and they were a real barrier between the city and the countryside. All of that evaporates after about 1650, when Naples really needs migrants, and it begins to expand, and the effective uh, function of those walls, the walls become anachronistic, let's put it just that way. Uh, they no longer serve as a barrier uh, between uh, the civic and the extra urban communities. Uh, and the city itself uh, is porous, and it's what I refer to as an open city. Local uh, members of the intelligentsia or intellectuals, when they're describing their own city, they will refer to it as a metropolis. And by metropolis, they mean a large city that resembles the uh, uh, ancient splendor of Rome, or the splendor of ancient Rome, uh, I should say. I really use it more as a synonym for the open city uh, and um, really want to restore to the notion also of the metropolitan area as a city that is open. One of the things I hope to make plain for my audience and for the audience of my book is that the idea of the nation is also born within the capital. It's because the nation itself does um, uh, implode upon the capital city. Uh, and it's thanks to this implosion then that administrators within the capital will then, uh, in a certain sense, become familiarized with the provinces and take more of an interest in the provinces and help to undertake um, uh, reform projects and uh, projects that involve the centralization of the kingdom uh, and the production of a nation. But the nation is really something that I think is an idea that's born within the capital.